view. Um, what was pro what prompted it was the anniversary in 2005 um, of the synagogue, so um, of the opening of the D Street synagogue. So that would have been 60 year anniversary, and this year's 75 years. Um, and that led to the um, what was pro what prompted it was the anniversary. Sorry, just hearing myself back there. Um, and uh, it led to the publication of this book. I can share the link. Um, so Caledonian Jews, a study of, um, can't read it backwards, a study of seven small communities in Scotland. And um, in this book, I looked at um, the communities outside of Glasgow and Edinburgh. So Aberdeen, Air, Dundee, Dunfermline, Falkirk, Greenock, Inverness, the Highlands and Islands. So um, and that was published a few years ago now um, in 2009. The interesting thing is, um, despite the fact that actually I teach film studies at Bangor University in North Wales and have moved away from Scotland, Scotland keeps coming back to me. And last year I contributed to this book um, produced by the archives, the Scottish Jewish Archive Centre. Um, but this might be another one uh it's chapters on um 14 chapters and all sorts of things to do with scotland that you might be interested in um so i'm i'm hopefully that will go to support the archives if you buy a copy um as opposed to my pocket um i don't think i get much from anything i've published right so um so yeah so there's a little brief introduction it's quite fitting i'm in the um attic or garret of my house here in Bangor, North Wales. And um, that's quite fitting given that I lived in the attic of the synagogue um, for the two years that I, I was in Aberdeen. I like to think that I, I did my bit through rent of helping that uh, of helping the community um, to, to continue through that period as well as the contributions I might have made by going to synagogue um, and whatnot. So, but let's get on to the history. So I think Fiona's indicated uh, you can put thumbs up, thumbs down, Fiona, um, about half an hour. Um, you can do the old um, when you've when when I've gone on too long. Yep. And um, I'm going to try and share my desktop here and switch to. Um, now I can't see you anymore. So can you all see that? I get a thumbs up. You can see my. Um, Not yet. You need to press see. share. Share. Okay. Okay. Yep. Still not there. Yeah. Yep. 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 Right. There we go. Okay. Okay. I can't see you now, so um, but don't worry about that. Uh, Just to and. Just a hint, if you if you if people click on at the top of the screen where it says you are viewing Nathan Abrams screen, where it says view options, you can click on side by side mode and you get to see the speaker and the and the picture if you want to. I don't I don't have that. Okay. Can you um can you just indicate you can see an image now of uh the Aberdeen Jew, yeah? Oh. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. Right, so um, I can talk about this book. This is a um, book I came across talking about the shared uh, stereotype of the Aberdonian um, and, uh, and the Jew. I'll leave you to work out the link there, but I think the text at the bottom explains it all. Um, this is a book of jokes produced in, um, if I remember rightly, in the early part of the 20th century and um, probably wouldn't be published today. Anyway, so um, just to give some history of um, what I came across in terms of um, the link between Jews and Aberdeen, um, there's been lots of rumors and conjecture about uh, whether there are any Jews in Aberdeen um, before the 19th century. And um, there's been various accounts, all unconfirmed and unverified, of um, Jewish 
Jewish inhabitants to Aberdeen. Um, in the 14th century, for example, there was a Thomas Phil Isaac, a Thomas son of Isaac, um, but again, no proof. Some other um, authors have talked about a Judaic colony um, in Aberdeen that was expelled, um, but we have no um, suggestion of Jewish inhabitants in, in Aberdeen prior um, prior to um, the last few hundred years, um, despite rumors of them. But I will turn to this one. This is interesting. Um, this is a um, letter, I mean, you can read it, you can read the screen there. Um, um, so Cecil Roth, the great um, historian of um, British Jewish history, um, places the first record of Jews in Aberdeen in 1665, um, when reports the effect that a bark with silken sails and cordage, cordage manned by a crew speaking only Hebrew had been sighted off Scotland. Um, what he seems to be referring to here is this, a new letter from uh, Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, you can read the title there. And um, in, this, in this letter that was sent to a person of um, quality in London, um, they purport to have witnessed a ship arriving in the, in the port of Aberdeen um, with sails, with white branch satin sails emblazed in, 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 red word, in red letters with the words, these are the 10 tribes of Israel. Um, and then as the letter goes on, a large party of Jews dressed in black and blue and with stores of rice and honey. The professor of tongues and languages from the university was sent for, and he determined uh, that the crew spoke Hebrew and that the, um, and that the, um, those on board were bound for Amsterdam. Now, um, I'll, I'll flip, show you some more images of this letter. Uh, give you a chance to look at it and you can see um, you can see on this uh, on the right hand side about the tongues and languages and um, on this page it talks about these are the ten tribes of Israel and their stores of rice and honey now you know there's two ways to approach this number one we could say it's completely a work of fiction and um, many of the um, metaphors, the sort of literary tropes we find in there are common in fiction of, the, of that time in the 17th century. On the other hand, we could say it's true. Um, probably the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but it's been heavily embellished. Um, I remember when I was researching this, someone pointed out to me that a um, ship with silk ropes and white branch satin sails would have never left the port. And in my naivety, I thought because they weren't seaworthy and then it suddenly occurred to me what the person was telling me that, that obviously such things would have been too valuable to have been le left to sail off again. Anyway, so that's one of the more interesting connections of these rumours between Jews and um, Aberdeen in the 17th century. And had, um, had this, if this was true, um, those on board were probably on their way to join the pseudo messiah, the Shabtai Svi, in the Levant, and would not have stayed um, in Aberdeen. Um, what we can suggest, though, is that the, I mean, probably by all accounts, this letter is a work of fiction, uh, the product of a then fashionable flight of a London imagination playing to a London audience, and using Aberdeen as a convenient location because its remoteness made verification more difficult. So in this sense, Aberdeen is used because it's far away and possibly to London is somewhat exotic. Um, so we see no other mention of Jews in Aberdeen until the 18th century, um, when uh, in 1732, there's a report that the third Earl of Aboyne married um, Isabella, a Jewess daughter of Elias Levy, with whose relations he had a lawsuit in 1769. But that's all we know about that. Now, the next definite um, um, connection between Jews and Aberdeen is um, as doctors and the important role of Aberdeen's two universities um, in, in medicine. And, and by the two universities, 
Um, it was the two that, that eventually merged to become Aberdeen University, um, Marshall College and, and um, King's College. And um, what we see is between 1739 and 1829, 16 Jews graduated in medicine. They were largely foreign trained refugees from the Portuguese, Portuguese Inquisition and Aberdeen offered them a British medical qualification and a degree from a Scottish university that would have helped to enhance their standing and to attract patients. Um, what we have to remember at this time is that England only had two um, institutions of higher education, um, Oxford and Cambridge, and um, they kept Jews out. Um, in Scotland, there were, there were more um, institutions of higher education, um, there's two in Aberdeen alone, so thus rivaling England in the number. Um, um, but, you know, if you think Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, Dundee, uh, and so on. Um, well, not Dundee, um, I think St. Andrews is earlier. And um, what, what these universities offered was, was um, an education on a par with Oxbridge, um, but there was open entry and religious toleration and the fees and living expen expenses were relatively low. So this was very attractive um, for Jews. And so consequently, the first Jews in the entire English speaking world to gradu graduate with medical degrees um, did so from Aberdeen. The first person to graduate was um, the converso uh, Jacob de Castro Sarmento um, in 1739. Um, um, but as we'll see, of the 16 Jewish medical graduates who um, took degrees from Aberdeen, all but two of them took their degrees in absentia. So another attraction for them was they didn't have to go to Aberdeen to study. Um, it was more a kind of for um, um, a sort of, uh, 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 they, they were vouched for that they were, that they had passed. So some other names of these doctors were Ralph Schoenberg, David Cohen, Gumpertz, Lewison, um, and, and so on. So, so as I was trying to explain, these degrees were conferred by recommendation from at least two patient, uh, patrons attesting the candidate's medical standard, standing without written or oral exam examination. Um, so, so although there's a connection between Jews and Aberdeen, we don't see Jews uh, moving to Aberdeen. As a little postscript, two of the um, doctors turned out to be um, quack doctors. Um, one of them, uh, one of the affidavit, affidavits from two Liverpool doctors for one of these individuals were possibly forged, and, um, but he ended up making a fortune in Liverpool selling his patent medicine, the cordial balm of Gilead. He also sold a nervous cordial um, and sexually explicit writings on the dangers, prevention and treatment of, of sexually transmitted uh, diseases. Now, the first two uh, bona fide Jewish medical students who did move to Aberdeen um, was, um, so here's some pictures, I jump ahead there, were Enrist, Ernest Henriquez of Kingston, Jamaica, who came um, and graduated in 1898 and then left to practice in Lancashire. Um, although his daughter Stella studied, remained and studied in Aberdeen, graduating um, with degrees in 1923. So that's when we get the first kind of solid connection of Jews moving to Aberdeen. Um, but again, this isn't a community um, as such. When we do see the kind of um, beginnings of a bigger community uh, moving is in the 1840s. I mean, this is kind of true. I, um, we see the same thing in Bangor in North Wales um, when um, say Jews from Germany or German speaking Jews uh, begin to move to the UK. Um, and the Aberdeen directory for 1840 to 41 listed H. Rosenberg and company manufacturing furriers and importers of foreign skins at 115 Union Street. Um, we, we know about them. One of the ways that we know about Jews who moved to remote places is through court cases. And we know about these two because they were, um, they were accused of willful fire raising at their shop premises. And whilst we can't confirm that uh, they were Jewish, this is Harris Rosenberg and his wife, um, wife Alethea, the um, 
their first and last names certainly indicate a high probability of them being Jewish. Another Jewish um, um, person in Aberdeen at the time was M.A. Levy, a tailor, clothier and outfitter who was listed at 26 Union Street um, during 1849 to 1850. Um, Alfred Edersheim, born in Vienna in 1825, arrived in uh, Aberdeen, um, um, but he converted to... Those of you from Aberdeen are now apart, really has its um, origins in the late 19th century, as with so many of these communities um, in, the, in the UK in particular, or in the British Isles in particular, as part of that hu huge wave of immigration that moves um, westwards from, um, from uh, um, Central and Eastern Europe for a variety of reasons, whether it's to escape um, pogroms and anti-Semitism or um, czarist conscription or just simply to have a better life in the more industrialized West. Um, and that's when we see the origins of the Jewish community. So by the 1881 census, um, we have several Jewish families. Isaac Barnett from Russia as a master picture dealer living with his three children. Um, Myers Barnett from Prussia same profession um, with their um, children, Samuel Dreyer, and I could go on and, and reel off some, some more names. So we'd see a, the sort of nucleus or a kernel um, of the community in 1881. Um, the Aberdeen Directory, another place that we um, that I looked to find Jews, lists um, such Jews as Alex Zamek, who would become the future president of the synagogue, and he's listed there in 1884 to 85, and he was from Poland and naturalised in 1887. Um, so, according to reports um, from that period, from the late 19th century, although religious concerns were central to Aberdeen's Jews, they were a small group and a quote here, with very few exceptions of the poorest class. So a synagogue was not immediately affordable. Um, they may have met to worship in private um, or in somebody's home, but we don't have any evidence of this. Um, and evidently, um, and as is typical with many small communities, I'd, 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 I'd estimate there's a 10 to 15 year lag between the sort of origins of the community in terms of the people arriving and the um, ability of that community to raise enough capital to open up a building um, or to, to acquire suitable premises in which they can worship. Um, so in the fall of, so it didn't happen until August of 1893. So we're talking, like I said, about at least 10 to a dozen years after we see the first arrivals, the first, you know, sort of serious arrivals, as it were, um, when in 1893, they took the plunge and found suitable premises and the formal, um, first formal community, and the formal community was established on the 7th of September, um, when the synagogue was um, consecrated at 34 Marshall Street. And there's a shot of the building, at least as it was in circa 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, I don't know if it's, yeah, I think it was still there when I visited a few years ago. Um, so what we have is a, um, as we can see as typical again with small communities, it's not purpose built. It's located in two rented rooms on the first floor of this house at 34 Marshall Street um, at the end there and opposite Trinity Quay. Um, in the dockyard area of Aberdeen. It was described as, and I quote here, one of the lowest quarters of the town. A later congregant recalled the overwhelmingly fishy smell that would blow in off the, fort, off the North Sea. It cost 400 pounds, and because the congregation consisted of eight members, of whom only five can be looked to for substantial support, the community looked to wealthier Jews in London and the provinces for financial support. Um, 
The Jewish Chronicle at the time reported that the synagogue has been furnished in a handsome manner and presented a bright aspect. So no mention of the smell there. Um, and as I mentioned, Alexander Samek, Alex Samek became the synagogue's first president um, of this congregation. And whilst I was living there, we discovered a whole bunch of um, notes and minutes and things in the airing cupboard, um, which were copied and uh, with the Scottish Jewish archives and they have um, lots of interesting sort of details and anecdotes um, about the community. Not, not in its entirety, some of them have been lost, some of the minutes have been lost, but that's where I got quite a bit of this information from. So a provision was made for a minister, the Reverend James Lippman, uh, charitable and welfare organizations were set up to assist poorer Jews. Um, and the General Assembly of the Scottish Church, who were trying to convert Jews, um, and poor Jews were always a good target, um, for them noted that Aberdeen's Jewish poor are well cared for by their own rabbis and the better off people. So this meant that, that they weren't as susceptible to conversion um, than perhaps those who weren't as well cared for. And we also see a keen interest in Zionism. A shekel group was formed um, and Aberdeen's Jews bought, bought six shares in the Jewish Colonial Trust, um, which was a financial instrument um, established by Theodore Herzl um, to promote colonization schemes in, in, in Palestine. Um, so um, we, we have the, um, so then the next interesting thing that comes up again, like I said earlier, that one of the ways that we discover, um, we discover um, about Jews is through court cases. And uh, in, shortly after the opening of the synagogue, um, the uh, local branch of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals So um, it was said that they'd cruelly ill-treated and tortured the, the said Bullock. Um, and um, the, fortunately for, for them, um, the judgment was dismissed. And uh, obviously what the society um, was referring to was the method of shechita, of, of Jewish mode of slaughter. And um, the, the court ruled that, that, that this had been properly and skillfully carried out. Um, and uh, so Shechita resumed in Aberdeen in the following year. And not only that, a special delivery of Scottish beef was sent daily to London. Another little connection with Bangor, North Wales, is a surfeit of Welsh lamb. Um, it was also sent to London from Bangor, some um, kosher slaughtered lamb. Um, I can talk more about that, but um, as, as, as time moves on, um, So, you know, there's some discussion about whether that um, that court case was was motivated by anti-Semitism or, or actually genuine concern for the welfare uh, of, of the of the animal. Now, what we see in the next few years is in terms of religious terms is that um, is Aberdeen's Jews, and it was alluded to in the introduction, couldn't afford um, uh, always afford a permanent rabbi. So they had a series of visiting ministers on short term contracts as a very very fairly typical practice in the school at smaller communities um, and we see a succession Lippmann stays for several years he's succeeded by Morris Cohen who's then replaced by A. E. Hershevitz who's then um, replaced by Ostroff um, oh, there's um, I think what's the Jewish Chronicle for you I'm trying to this should be the advert for Welsh meat in there um there we are uh there we can see the advert of a delivery of meat from from um scotch House. by the way as i can't see you when you want me to um finish you're gonna have to do it verbally fiona so i'll, I'll leave that bit of information with you so there's the advert that's fine at the moment it's still riveting thank you okay <laughs> still <laughs> um so you can hopefully you can read that i can can't make that bigger. Um, let's close my update from Haaretz. Um, right, we'll talk about um, these chaps. 
Right. So one of the reasons for this high turnover of um, of uh, um, ministers is the pay was notoriously low. Um, it's been suggested by one historian that this reflects a lack of respect for religious leadership um, rather than the lack of simple funds. Um, but what this meant was that those who were engaged as ministers in, in, in Aberdeen had to supplement their income by doing other things. Um, in addition to um, um, leading the congregation. So they had, they had to kind of multitask. Um, they had to um, be the, the, the minister, they, they teach the Hebrew classes and they had to slaughter the animals and they had to perform the circumcisions, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I would make jokes, but I can't get any sense of reaction. So <laughs> about one hopes they didn't get their duties confused in that respect. Um, now, the thing that really interested me and that still interests me is, um, is Aberdeen um, kind of is an outlier, not just geographically, but in British Jewish history for remaining um, one of the few small communities that, that continues to survive as others uh, are closing. I mean, I'm not sure what Dundee's official status is. I think last I heard they were very close to closing. Um, I might be wrong, so I apologize if I've got that information incorrect, but um, as a formal community, the fact that Aberdeen still survives um, when really the only other communities and um, formal communities tend to be in Glasgow and Edinburgh and we see the same in England, in Wales there's um, uh, only in South Wales and um, Chlandidno has a synagogue but that's owned by Chabad and um, not by the community. So, so the thing that's always intrigued me is how Aberdeen has managed to survive um, and, and as a community and it's had its ups and downs but it's still sort of ploughed through and the, the theory I sort of came up with was what we call a revolving door community is that the losses in terms of numbers were balanced. So outgoing numbers in terms of people who either passed away or left were not necessarily, they were, they were balanced by incomers. Um, so maybe not to the same extent, but there were enough coming in that a community services minion in could be maintained. And whilst um, Aberdeen has never offered large-scale employment for Jews and the community was never large, um, it's offered enough employment opportunities to attract incomers and I think that's the part, part of the secret to its survival. It's not the only part but part of it. Um, so if we were to look at numbers in 1896 to 97 we're looking at 12 seat holders um, Although the Aberdeen Journal reports 50 present at inaugural Jewish New Year services in September 1893, um, and the community community was sizable enough to merit a visit from the then chief rabbi in 1896. Um, by 1907 to 1908, the community had almost doubled to 23 seat holders. Um, and, but that, by that point, the 1905 Aliens Act had reduced the numbers of Jews entering Britain. And so this would have limited further growth in Aberdeen to, in, uh, uh, to internal migration only. Um, in 1913, a cemetery is founded um, when a portion of the Public Grove Cemetery was sectioned off for use as a Jewish burial site. I do have some images of that actually, I'll just flick through these. Um, Oh, they'll, they'll come later on. I'll go back. There we go. Um, so um, that was quite important because up until that point, without a local cemetery, um, people had to be buried um, 150 miles away, which you can see creates its own um, issues. Um, so the um, cemetery was secured in 1913. And um, and um, continues, um, I believe, to to today. I hope so. Um, so to get back to this bit about um, employment, um, which is sort of what I wanted to move on to, is uh, what what attracted Jews to um, um, to to such a remote and isolated place um, in some people's eyes. Um, I mean, not least because Jews tend to immigrate to urban rather than rural areas. And whilst Aberdeen's a city, it's, you know, it's, it's not a huge city uh, in the sense of um, 
of, of, of some of the bigger metropolises in the UK. Um, by the late 19th century, Aberdeen's a fair size. Um, it ranks as the 22nd largest provincial town. Its population in 1871 stands at almost 90,000, and it doubled to 106, almost doubled to 163,000 um, by 1911. Um, and its um, economy is based around a number of industries. Back then, paper making, granite quarrying, polishing, Ad Aberdeen Angus, beef cattle rearing, and shipbuilding. Um, but the city's main reputation by the late 19th century was based on fishing, hence the overwhelmingly fishy smell in the synagogue. Um, and it's always been a fr thriving port and from 1870s onwards underwent something of a herring boom. And Aberdeen herring became a mark of quality in the Baltic. Um, um, in 1882, the fishing industry was transformed by the arrival of the first steam trawler and white fish stocks um, began to be um, exploited. So as you can see, as, as trade flourishes, there's a need for subsidiary industries, um, both to supply um, the supply chain to the fishing industry itself, but also to supply the workers in their other more general needs. So that's one of the reasons that would have attracted Jews to, to the area. And, and typically what we see is, and we see, um, is that um, Jews might start off as peddlers, um, wandering the countryside and then moving back to a base somewhere else. I mean, Aberdeen is probably a bit too far away to do that. We see it in Bangor, for example, where Jews from Liverpool wander in the countryside and then return to back to Liverpool for the Sabbath. And then after they've accumulated enough capital, they move more permanently to Bangor and open a shop. Now we see the same in Aberdeen, although I wonder, you know, in Aberdeen, the would have been a bit too far to wander from somewhere else necessarily, although um, one could get the train. And again, all of this mass migration to the UK is facilitated by cheap steamship travel and then and then train travel. Um, but when we see the congregation formed in the 1890s, 1880s, 1890s, the majority of its members are self-employed, working at home or in backstreet workshops in crafts such as cabinet making, tailoring, shoe and hat making, petty shopkeepers, peddlers, hawkers, traveling salesmen, um, traveled widely to the villages of the Northeast, selling their wares and returning home for the Sabbath. And their language and accents would have been a mixture of Yiddish, English and Scottish. Um, most likely these first commercial travels set, settled in Glasgow and other Scottish towns in the central belt, venturing north by train to Aberdeen, and like I said, returning home for the, for the Shabbat. Um, and they were seeking um, economic opportunities and uh, uh, that the um, competition in, in places like Glasgow didn't afford them. So um, if there's a lot of competition in Glasgow, you, you go off outside in order to um, to, to make a living. Um, and what we see is that there's a fairly homogenous occupational status until the end of the First World War, and that Jews were concentrated in a fairly small number of trades and retail businesses, tailoring furniture, shoes, fish, clothing, fur and fruit. Um, one of the more unusual occupations was that of the president of the congregation, Zamek, who was cited again in the court um, in 1896 as a Jewish usur usurer. Um, and then we see that the um, community is boosted by the seasonal influx of commercial agents, um, particularly um, Jewish salesmen from Russia during the herring season. Um, and so that's another way that we see um, Jews coming to Aberdeen, but they're not necessarily staying. Um, one example of, of a family, um, as, as they're on the Skype call, is that some pioneering Jewish peddlers didn't stop at Aberdeen, um, but used it as a base for going Now, Nathan, sounds... Sorry about that. Nathan, we didn't hear that last bit. Uh, up to where? Mm, the last few sentences, couple of sentences. Okay. Is that, I was talking about the Greenwald family. Okay. If you want to share your screen while you're not talking to the screen. Okay. Then we, we can go. You. All right. So, um, so whilst some people 
move from um, Aberdeen, move to Aberdeen. There were some who used Aberdeen as a base for going even further afield. And that includes the Harry, Louis, Hyman and Wolf Greenwald, um, who travelled from what is now Belarusia to Glasgow and then Aberdeen before settling in Lerwick. But you'll hear more about that in a future talk, I, I believe. Um, so after they landed in Glasgow, they trudged along dirt roads to Aberdeen, attempting to sell jewellery along the way and picking up the occasional lift on farm, farm wagons. And then they um, took the boat to Shetland, where they eventually settled. Um, and we see others um, who made their livings trudging um, along the roads of Shetland, who also arrived from Aberdeen, Julius Quint. Um, um, again, find out about some of these people through court cases. Now, what I want to talk about was um, what the next slide referred to as professionalization. So this this immigrant, this first generation, um, when these kind of working class occupations, um, it was their children who kind of benefited more. And um, in between the two world wars, we see um, some, um, we see some, let me share my screen again. We see some, But Nathan has now frozen. Bet you'll come back soon. So. Nathan's now frozen, and I expect he'll come back to us shortly. Wave to us if the rest of you can see us. Fiona, Fiona, yes. um, I, I don't know very much about Zoom, but I do know that if you have a multiple one like this, there's a 40 minute limit on it. Would that be, uh, and you have to reset it. No. Would that be the case for this one? No, that's not the case for this one. That's not, not if you right. have you have a pro paid for one but thanks okay that's fine oh, it's another thing which is that nathan nathan's internet isn't very good yay <laughs> um so we've got some questions um already down here so i expect he'll be coming back soon the questions that i've seen are um, I'm going to put them in the chat again. The chief rabbi was a trustee of Aberdeen Hebrew Congregation. Do we have any thoughts as to why that happened? Did any members of the Jewish community hold public office in Aberdeen and what contributions did they make to life? Did we come across a family called Bittina Bootmakers? Fascinating. And then, um, so I'm going to put these questions down here for everyone and then maybe some other people. That looks like Nathan's back. Nathan's back. That's great. Where is Nathan? I'm here. Sorry, I got kicked out there. Yay, welcome back. So can we see you? Um, in the spotlight. Be able to. Good. I can see me and I can see you. Great. Um, I can't see your face. If you don't share your screen, then we should be able to see your I, no, it, it's gone into the default. Um... <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Okay. So. Okay. I was about to, yeah. Um, I was any... just about to show you some. Um, just the the. Um, hopefully. No, that's the Zoom. You just there shared. We go. Can you see a picture of a cinema? Yes. Um, so what we see between the wars is the the community becoming a bit more sort of bourgeois, a bit more well-to-do. Their children are able to benefit from university education and they begin to branch out. And um, 
this fits into what I'm hired to do at Bangor, which is teach film studies. Um, Ernest Bromberg opens, uh, who was the proprietor of Aberdeen's first public dance hall, the Palais de Dance, um, situated in Diamond Street, not far from a synagogue. Um, as an avid cinema enthusiast, he began to hold cinema orientated uh, events there from 1926. And he opened Aberdeen's first news cinema in September 1936 until 1963. Um, other Jewish professionals also arrive in Aberdeen, such as Bennett Teff in 1936, a civil servant in customs and excise. And um, I, I was going to show you this picture here um, is because, um, like I said, um, as Jews um, became more economically successful, native Abedonians, uh, Abedonian Jews uh, began to graduate from university in entering such professions as medicine, law and teaching. Um, but this then has a negative impact. Um, well, um, but it has a positive impact in the sense they get more educated and the families move towards the more affluent West End of Aberdeen. But the negative side of it is that um, is that that these 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 um, Jews with degrees begin to move away. Um, we do see um, in during the depression, uh, just before the depression from 1927 onwards, um, some American Jews who are unable to gain places in medical schools in the United States um, because of anti-Semitic quotas began to study in Aberdeen. And between 1928 and 1930, we see 11 Americans um, were admitted. Um, they were virtually all um, graduates of either New York University or the City College of New York, the Jewish University. And we see some from South Africa, um, but they only stay temporarily and um, return home, sometimes taking Scottish brides with them. Um, so um, the character of the community in religious terms is by and large East European Ashkenazi. Um, there's never been a strong, I mean, there have been Sephardim in, um, in, in Aberdeen, but it's never been um, a kind of Sephardic community as such. Um, we see in just before World War II, um, uh, after the... Um, Can you turn off your sharing when you're not talking about this picture? Because it's nice to see you. Please. Okay. <laughs> I think you're the first person to ever say that. <laughs> um, so what we see in 1936 is a trickle of German Jews um, begin to come to Aberdeen. Um, in 1938, the Aberdeen Refugee Committee was established and, and instrumental in bringing a number of Jewish families to Aberdeen. And one of those was, uh, one of, some of those were the Kress family. Um, other notable figures include the eminent philosopher Emil Fackenheim and his father Julius, a um, very famous um, post-Holocaust philosopher, Emil, Emil Fackenheim. He spent two years in Aberdeen um, and uh, apparently picked up a distinctive brogue which he never lost um, for the rest of his life. We see others, Peter Landsberg, um, Rudolf Schlesinger and the educators Kurt Hahn, Karl Koenig uh, amongst others and um, they set up um, the Gordonston School founded by Kurt Hahn which I'm sure you all know about and if you didn't I'm sure you've seen it in the crown. Um, and the Camp Hill Rudolf Steiner, Steiner schools were um, established by Karl Koenig just outside Aberdeen. So another interesting sort of um, um, connection there with, with, with the history. Um, what I was going to move on to was, um, if, uh, if I share my screen here, is so in 1945, the community has grown to such an extent that um, a new building is warranted. And um, part of the reason for the growth of the community during World War II were um, evacuees, refugees, and other military personnel who were either moved to Aberdeen or nearby. Um, and we see a boost in the numbers of the community um, um, as Jewish service personnel who are in, in some of the numerous bases in and around Aberdeen uh, and Northeast Scotland. 
are um, in, invited to synagogue services and into people's homes, um, such as uh, Ernest Bromberg's dance hall. Um, obviously, this led to liaisons between the service personnel and members of the local community. Um, but as we see, in 19, by 1945, by the end of the world, the community had grown, that had outgrown the building in, in, uh, um, in Marshall Street and, um, and had become wealthier um, for the reasons I mentioned. So um, they acquire the, the current building, which was described in the introduction, and, um, and that was at 74 D Street, and that was consecrated, as you can see, on 6 June 1945. Um, you can see the... Uh, opening of the order of service there um, and a um, what I always find fascinating as you see this through accounts of um, synagogue services is that they attract a lot of interest in the local press and non-Jews often um, show an interest in attending and there's usually a long description in the, in the local paper um, so that's where we've got um, quite a bit of detail um, about that and Again, the kind of um, vibrant cultural, social cultural, as well as religious life continues post-war. And we see a literary and social society, a WITSO, um, a ladies' guild, um, and um, amongst, amongst other things um, are, are set up in the post-war era. Um, the... Um, first permanent rabbi was established in 1956 um, and that was this is this is a this is a rarity for a small community and the Aberdeen appointee was Dr. Gustav Finkst who was from Germany um, who studied under Rabbi Leo Beck So there's another picture from the opening of the this picture of my dog um, of the opening of the synagogue. So you can see the dignitaries in their top hats. Um, here's another um, image from the opening of the synagogue, which I believe was taken upstairs in, in the synagogue. I think it. I, th I believe this photo was supplied by one of those of you in the Zoom call. If you recognise yourself in there. Um, and there's an example of the Seder that um, I believe this is you, Pauline Terrett, in there. Um, and, and you supplied this to me probably at least a decade ago now. Is that is that you there? Um, you have to unmute yourself, Pauline. I think it's you, Pauline. I might be wrong. Um, but this is the Seder. Um, you see, very nice, lavish affair. No plastic. Um um, uh, held upstairs in the synagogue and an example of this um, um, of, of this communal life that we see in Aberdeen in the post-war era. Um, so in terms of numbers, by 1965, the population of Aberdeen is 85, and I think that uh, the Jewish population of Aberdeen, um, eight of those were children and they're being taught in Hebrew classes. Um, and then we see various people sort of coming and going in the in the in the in the, in the decades um, in the previous in, in the decades since. Um, um, so we have Phil and Sarah Orkin from Canada. Uh, Phil taught zoology at the University of Aberdeen, while Sarah was the first registered dietitian in the city. Um, they they led the services and the seders, and the house became the focus of the community. Um, where they, they invited in students as well. Two of those students were Valerie and Frank House from London, um, who visited Aberdeen as part of an academic conference in 1963. And they later returned to study in Aberdeen and stayed for five years when Frank became a lecturer in pharmacology and statistics at, at, at the Aberdeen Medical School. Um, so what we see is one of the reasons that I said earlier was the continued survival of this community um, is because of the ability to um, um, attract people um, to to Aberdeen and the, the two universities and various other industries, particularly the oil and gas and um, oil and gas industry, um, was was one of the reasons.
for why Jews um, came to Aberdeen, and also the hospitals as well. Um, just trying to um, look through. So, um, like a five minute warning then. Yep, yep, that's good. Um, I was trying to think about at one point, I think there were three, no less than three Jewish helicopter pilots ferrying oil workers back and forth to the rigs. Um, so, um, I mean, I've tried, you know, in, in the book, which was published 2009, that's where I took it up to. Um, although I've kept abreast of events since, but more from a kind of um, personal curious um, um, interest rather than um, an academic one. Um, but as I said, if you want to buy loads of copies of that and um, get the uh, get get the publisher to ask me to update it, I'd be happy to do it. But you know what we can see is is that I mean my perception was from 2004 onwards there was something of a mini revival back then. But things building aside, and I can be corrected, <laughs> is and I'm only reading through the emails, is that the community seems to have sort of, in a sense, gone from strength to strength in the number of activities it was holding, it's holding, compared to the activities that were on offer when I was there for a bit, two years, you know, a book club and, and, and visitors, Rabbi Rose coming up quite often and doing the Purim service and and um, various bar mitzvahs being celebrated and bat mitzvahs in different, different um, according to different religious sort of, styles um and and it's been interesting to follow the community in in that sense in the sense that the in the years since i've left uh, not not that there's seems to have been quite a lot of activity um at least judging by the email lists um unless they're written for my benefit as the historian but i don't believe that um so one of the reasons i mean i think to sum up um is is aberdeen's i mean as i said i I'm intrigued by this. If we, you know, North Wales, there's one synagogue and it's not owned by the community. Aberdeen is kind of surviving against the odds. And, and I'd attribute that to two things. One, it's this sort of revolving door um, community, the ability to attract new people into the area um, through large employment opportunities um, on the one hand. But also, it doesn't matter how many Jewish people you have in an area, you still need the commitment of a few core families and individuals to keep things going. Um, so um, it's really a tribute to those people over the years who've um, invested that time and energy in keeping things going um, in, in keeping the events and turning up, ringing around, um, whatever it is they had to do. Um, I mean, one of the tricks I always heard was that um, if a Jewish man had married out and he wanted a minion, he rang his wife um, and she made sure he turned up. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of the anecdotes uh, 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 I was told. So, so you know, I mean, I have a, you know, I suppose I'll get personal here as my conclusion. I have a lot of fondness for Aberdeen. And it's a shame I had to leave, um, but that was not my fault. That was the was the then head of school who decided he didn't want to keep me on but um it it's nice to see that, that things have continued um, um and, and you know of this of which this was one event is an example um i think at that point uh, i can try and answer anything i haven't covered um but i think that would be a good place to stop fantastic so i'm gonna um, unmute you for two seconds. This really doesn't work well, but I can unmute you and do for you to do a little bit of a clap. There, hang on. Unmute all. Oh. Oh. Thank you so much. Hang on, I shall unmute Nathan. So, um, I've got a few questions that people have. Am I unmuted? I've got a few questions that people have sent in. So I shall just go, I'll go through them and then we'll take some more questions. So along the way, if you want to just put your hand up, if you've got other questions, then Jean, put your real hand up like this and then Jean will write down who's waiting with questions and let me know afterwards. So first question, the Chief Rabbi was a trustee of Aberdeen Hebrew Community. Have you got any thoughts or background about how that happened? Or anyone else that might know that? Um... That probably was standard practice, because I think the synagogue um, is a. I can't remember if it was exact affiliation status. Um, 
um, obviously isn't part of the United Synagogue officially, but follows it in terms of practice. Okay. So I think it's probably standard practice. I have to double check this. Nathan, can from. you hear me? Yes. It wasn't standard practice. We appear to have been unique. And okay. that's what we can't understand is why the chief rabbi was a trustee when we were not affiliated to the United Synagogue. Gustav Finsk was trained by Leo Beck, so was Reform. And so was Harry Jacobi, who came after Gustav Finsk. So we're, we're at a loss to, you just can't work it out. Okay. A mystery. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to like say, I'd have to research that one further. I mean, the thing that interests me from observation is, and, and I've seen this elsewhere, is you're right in pointing out the reform um, training of of the of some of the rabbis, is that um, is 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 there's fairly looser practices adopted by smaller communities in terms of trying to maintain a community. I mean that, that's it, there's a flexibility there for two reasons. One, Jews have got more rigid um, as we've got closer to the 20th and 21st centuries so there are practices that orthodox jews perhaps would have done then that wouldn't be tolerated by their grandchildren now um so that that's just a general kind of move to sort of more stringency that we don't see in the past but secondly there's a kind of pragmatic flexibility um if you're going to insist on you know four halachic requirements in, in, in the more far-flung communities where you where it's harder to keep a community going, um, you either go with stringency and don't have a community or you, you're a bit more flexible and you allow um, the, the community to... I mean, you know, the, at least when I was there, there wasn't a machitza or a partition in the synagogue, which wouldn't be tolerated in any other type of united synagogue, right? So you do see some um, flexibility there and also because the chief rabbi... So I'd have to look into this... Um, Yes. Okay, another question. Did any members of the Jewish community hold public office in Aberdeen and what contributions did they make to civic life? That could be Nathan or other people in the room might know. Well, they all made contributions to civic life. I mean, that's one of the things that um, um, Jews all become well integrated. I'm just looking through my notes to see who, um, offhand, I can't think of public office in Aberdeen. Um, but, you know, Jews don't just keep themselves to themselves in a place like Aberdeen. So um, they're all contributing, even if it isn't through um, election or whatnot. Um, but I can't, I haven't got in my notes anything about elected officials or that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and then there's a couple of name, name checks that individ you might know or other people in the room might know. So. Did you come across the Bittiner bootmakers? Very well to do. We're in Aberdeen at the 1911 census, and their daughter Elsa married Mark Wolf from London in Edinburgh in 1907. This is from Gillian, who's a marriages in Edinburgh expert. Uh, so, um, can I say something? Yeah, go for it. Yes, no, no, just that they they were intriguing because they, they were obviously doing pretty well and they got a husband from their daughter from London, which showed, you know, that you had to be pretty doing pretty well to do that. Um, I wondered if they had been, had anything to do with the synagogue. Bittener was their name. And a lot of them hung around Aberdeen. A lot of them married out, but another one, one or two married in Edinburgh. Uh -huh. um, I have in my notes in 1909, Leopold Bittener won second prize in the Christmas competition of the Balmagat. <laughs> following year, Lewis Bitten, Louis Bittner was, you know, his answer to the previous question, was unanimously elected as the candidate for Aberdeen Parish Council. Yeah. Ah, very good. To become the yes. vice chairman of the local ward committee. Um, so, yes, I do, that name does ring a bell, actually. Um, yes, no, they were obviously pretty well off. I haven't looked out, out. They, lived, they lived on, on the keys, oh, no, no, they had, they had a business on the quayside, wood making. And bookmakers were a step up from shoemakers, as far yeah. as I could see at that time. I love the fact of the question uh, will answer the previous question. So here's another question. Nice. This question. So 
Somebody came to Aberdeen in 1973, was a student midwife working with an obstetrician called David Abramovich. Was he one of, um, one of the community? Um, well, yeah, there's an interesting thing. One thing I did discover is there's always a discrepancy between the different sort of numbers. So I remember looking at census data, um, I think it would have been about 2001 then, that said something like there's about 150 Jews of birth in Aberdeen, but 100 who put Jewish as their current religion. So that provides one discrepancy. And then secondly, out of those 100, how many of them um, went to synagogue um, and then how many of them were members? Um, so so whilst a name like that would suggest that person was Jewish, um, I don't have a record of them in, in my notes here, but um, that might be because they didn't necessarily the only what I have access to is the kind of community's records um, rather than the list of every Jewish person that might have been in Aberdeen. So that 150 that the census might have mentioned in 2001. Yeah, that's always in most in most towns with small communities. There's like three times more Jews in the census than ones that the community knows. It's really frustrating. Yeah, and then there's those you know whether you might pop into synagogue, um, or and but you might never become a member, so you're not really on the radar. Yeah, another question. Don't know if this would be your ambit. Um, somebody's interested in levels of anti-Semitism in Aberdeen. Um, yeah, I I I I missed that out for time, but um, you know, I called that section a city of tolerance. So, whilst to say that there wasn't um, none, um, I don't think the levels um, were particularly high either. Um, so, while we do see some anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic uh, activity in Aberdeen over the years. Um, it's it's nothing like we've witnessed in other UK cities. I mean, it's probably worse in Dundee, right, um, than than um, in the eighties than it was in in Aberdeen. So, I, d I don't want to say there was none, but I don't want to over exaggerate it either. I mean, I do remember at the time when I was living there, a swastika was sprayed on a bus stop, which I reported, and um, I remember speaking to the police. And whilst a Jewish person would perceive that as an anti-Semitic hate crime. We don't know whether the person spraying it meant it in that way. So you know, <laughs> it might not even know what it was. And then he's, you know, there's a Welsh goalkeeper who gave a Nazi salute and claimed he'd never heard of the Nazis. So, you know. um, but yeah, by and large, the record, um, I'm going to say it's not unblemished, but it's certainly not that of other places. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. If anybody else has got a question, please put your hands up and Jean will note who you are and we'll come back to you. Um, if Jean fl flicks through the screen to check whether anyone's got their hands up or else there's a little hand thing below your name in the um, participants that you can stick up a little, a little sign. Um, so somebody's saying, um, and I certainly found this when I first started working for Skojek 10 years ago and came and did research up there. Um, when I used to go to synagogue in Aberdeen, this is, this is someone else saying, when I used to go to synagogue in Aberdeen, there seemed to be several large Israeli families coming to Aberdeen to work in the oil industry. I don't know if that's still the case. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you do see Israelis coming. I don't know about the oil industry. They certainly come, um, um, Israeli students would come to study. And um, there, were, there were at least two well, three actually, when I was there in 2004, 2006. Um, and also to probably work in um, either universities or or, or, um, or, or, or the hospitals. Um, I'm just trying to I'll have a look through. Um, whether they're specifically with the um, oil industry, um, that I don't know. So, so we have uh, one gentleman who's a, chef offshore a lot of the israelis are actually in the university um the, the mathematicians or computer scientists uh Ehud knows most of them i think um but they tend to come to the non-religious activities so they come to poem and hanukkah 
that don't come to regular services and don't tend to come on Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, but that's basically it. I suppose if you're an Israeli and you're coming to Aberdeen, you're probably not looking um, for a synagogue, so that's not so surprising. But they do come sometimes. Um, yeah, bear in mind that um, uh, my my information goes up to my ethnographic information goes up to two thousand six, um, or well, two thousand eight, and um, the rest is through email. So so people like Mark and Debbie and Hillary and Fiona will have a much better uh, knowledge of what's happened in the last decade than I will. So um, did you say it was that an Israeli chef I heard, as in as in a cook? Yes, we have a cook who. Um serves on one of the offshore platforms um and he's a very good cook um <laughs> so but that's what he does he, he uh, i think he now works three weeks on two weeks off um yeah. that's fine and occasionally he comes and when he does come it's a bit of a surprise because you think oh i recognize you <laughs> but we have one guy who's a, a diver um and so he, he comes occasionally when he's not diving uh, so we have a whole range of mixture of people um, we, work in the oil we work in the oil industry, um, and we lost families when when we had the big recession a couple of years ago. We lost a lot of families just left uh, because there was no longer an expat uh, requirement in the city, so they went home, and that made a really big difference to us. And um, again, we're going to get hit again this year, so um, it's really it's driven by the university now. That seems to be the main attractor of uh, people coming in. And but when, when the families left that were related to the oil industry, that meant we lost all our young people. So we have very few young people now, which is real, real shame. Yeah. Here's another so, question that's more, um, more historic, more up your street, Nathan. So Evan Becker-Sorsky says, my great-great-grandmother Julia Levy ran the Aberdeen Fishing Company in Leith, Edinburgh. Do you have any information about Jews in the fish trade in Aberdeen? Um, yeah, I mentioned what I did know um, earlier. Uh, I'll just, um, which is... Um, so, so um, the Scotsman reported that during the herring season, Jewish salesmen from Russia um, who do business at Aberdeen, Peterhead and Fraserburgh augment the resident Jewish community. Um, I haven't come, I mean, you know, I didn't come across, um, so I'll carry on. In the days before World War I, they were involved with... Um, they're involved in or with the firms that handled the herring trade through Russia, um, through ports such as Riga, uh, Memel, St. Petersburg and Königsberg. Um, others may have worked or traveled on the fishing fleets during herring season, including I've one Leon Harris from um, Galicia. Um, Galicia. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's the information I have on, 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 Jews in the fishing trade. Ah, okay. So I think we might have come to the quest end of the questions, and um, it's been fascinating and a really brilliant start to our set of three, um, a very fitting start to our set of three talks, focusing so much on the community in Aberdeen and start so starting off where we need to go on. So Maybe we're looking to the next 75 years of Aberdeen community. And so this might be the first year of that. So thank you so much to everybody for joining us in these strange times. In these strange times, we seem to be able to do things, you know, there's loads, you know, it's awful and the isolation is horrible. And the fact that we can't get together for events is really horrific and then what's been happening is that we've been able to have these amazing opportunities with 70 people being able to book in for a talk um 150 people being able to come to a yiddish open mic 300 people being able to come from all over the world to a klezmer concert and so 
I wouldn't have been able to get you this many to, this many in your audience if you'd just come to the show. So it's lovely. And also, you'd have had to have come all the way from Wales. So it's great. Oh, no, I mean, when this is all over, I'd happily do this in person. Excellent. So it's been fabulous to welcome everybody to this event. Um, we're going to turn off the um, recording now and we're going to, and I'll be, I'll hold the meeting open for another 20 minutes if anybody just wants to chat to each other, if you're feeling isolated and want to 